Major support for these broadcasts is provided by New York Community Bank, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chelsea Lighting, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, The Wickhoff Group, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, Bruce Mosler, C.B. Richard Ellis, Colliers International, New York, LLC, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, DDG Partners, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Flushing Bank, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackle Realty Services, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Sterling and Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, and these friends. You know, there are songs, there's music, people remember, it doesn't matter how old you are. You can't forget Stagger Lee, you can't forget Lottie Miss Clotty, and you can't forget personality. And there's a man who's done all this. There's a man who's in six different Hall of Fames. There's a musician, a lyricist, a writer, and more important, my friend. Lloyd Price. I'm telling his life story today. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Lloyd. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for having me. So tell me about the kid from Kenner, New Orleans, Louisiana. You were born in 1933, right? That's right. Okay, and, and you were telling me a uh, small little family, what, 11? A very small one. Eight boys and three girls. Right, and, and your dad, what did dad do? My dad was a plumber and he was a longshoreman. He was a longshoreman first and then he went into his own business as a plumber when he started running the sewage uh, through New Orleans. And then mom, she, she was an entrepreneur too, right? Yes, my mother had a, uh, a sandwich shop, but she only opened like from Thursday to, through Saturday and she had fish sandwiches. And it was, uh, it was really good because during that time, any income at all was a help to the family because we had a real big family. Now you you had you tell me was it the, the quarter or the nickels uh, that you, you had that that part time job when you were a kid? Well, actually, it was fifty cents. They called it full bits. Right. The first job I had. Well, my real first job I had, Mike, was on a on an ice truck. I worked yeah, for that's right. you tell yeah me. I worked for a guy called Mister Joe, and uh, I was carrying 25 pounds of ice at seven and a half, eight years old. And I'd do that two hours in the morning before school. And uh, everybody had to work to support the family. So I was the ice boy. And that was my first job. And then what about the two bits? Well, I got paid four bits. <laughs> a quarter was two bits and 50 cents was four bits. With him, I got four bits for doing the two hours in the morning on ice truck. The quarter, the two bits came when I was sweeping for a guy called Ike Santana there in Kenner. He had a he had what they call a juke. And I'd sweep both sides of it and he'd give me a quarter. On mostly on Monday mornings after the weekend. 
place. He had sawdust on the floor, spit tombs and all that stuff. And this was one of the first places where I think I got hooked on music. How'd that happen? Well, sweeping this place, there was two sides to the place. It was the white side and the black side. You know what I'm talking about? Back in the 48, 49. And the South was still, you could still hear uh, Robert E. Lee coming through there. <laughs> you get 25 cents extra if you were on the black side of the Yeah, no, no, no. It was the same amount for sweeping. And one morning I was in there, he had gotten this new, well, we call it a jukebox. And I saw all these great lights. I don't know whether it was a Rockola or a Wurlisa, but I saw these lights, you know, it was turning. And at that time, there was only 10 records on a, uh, on a, on a jukebox called A Nickel A Play. And I'd put a nickel in there, or he'd put a nickel in there. He'd ask me to dance. And I'd start dancing. And one day, he put it in there, and I heard Louis Jordan with Caldonia. Caldonia! Caldonia! What make your big head so hard? Mop! Man, I thought that was... The End of the World. What a great record I thought that was by Louis Jordan. Louis Jordan and his Tempity Five. And I started dancing, and uh, I think from that time on, I knew what I was going to be doing the rest of my life. You had this guy who who was a pitch man for Maxwell House Coffee. Okie dokie Smith. This came came about two years later. He was the first black jockey on the radio that we... Right, because the, what you and I said is everybody thought that Amos and Andy were black, but they That's were white. Right. That's right. Up until that point, yeah. we thought Amos and Andy was black because they was perpetrating a fraud as acting like black folks, you know, a king figure, oh, you know, so we thought they were black. But the first real black guy I heard on the radio was Okie Dokie Smith. He was on for Maxwell House Coffee. And he used to say what? Lord and Miss Cody. Eat your mother's homemade pies and drink Maxwell House coffee. And I'd snatch that little jewel out of a sentence, Lord and Miss Claudia. I mean, that stuck right in my head. So what happens next? What happened next was I tried to, uh, to write a song. You know, I'd never tried that before, but what got me interested in doing that, I was also trying to learn how to play music because I knew there was something I was supposed to do in music. I just felt that in my soul that I must do something in music. I need to get on that jukebox. So when I heard Okie Dokie on the radio, and I kind of connected two together. If I get on the radio, I'd get on a jukebox. You know, so when I heard Lord and Miss Claudie, my brother had given me two horns. He had given me a trumpet and a fluga horn. But I was so small, I, I didn't have enough air, you know, to pump through those keys. So I said, well, I'll play piano. I tried to teach myself how to play play piano. So I learned how to play an eight-bar blues. Separating the black keys and the white keys was easy. You know, there's a lot of sevens in there, so you just, without me having a whole lot of fingers, I would start playing triplets, you know, because Fats Domino had came on the scene and triplets had got very popular. But at that time, Fats wasn't fat. No, he was not. He was not Fats. He had one record called a fat man, and he fitted right in my scheme. I said, oh, I could play that, you know, because you just shake your hand. And so when Okie Dokie, he had no real schedule, Mike, no real schedule. He'd be on the day for 20 minutes. You'd been out of him for two days. And the next two days, he'd come on at a different time. But it was always, Lord and Miss Claudie, eat your mother's homemade pies and drink Maxwell House coffee. So I started learning and playing around with that. And we kids at that time, uh, a lot of the new people today, the new kids think that rap uh, started, you know, 30 years ago. Rap been here a long time because we used to just make up rhymes. Rap started 62 years ago. From Way my long time ago. Right, right, right. <laughs> so we would make up rhymes just like the doo wops did, stand on the corner and everybody take a verse and do it. So I was just doing Lord and Miss Claudia like that. I had no set pattern. Each time I sung it, it would be something different. So one Friday afternoon, I was in my mother's shop. Nobody was there but her, her and I. So I'm on the piano, banging away, banging away. Lordy, 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 Miss Claudia, girl, you sure look good to me. 
And I happened to turn around through the corner of my eyes, and I saw this big guy standing there. And I stopped. No, I didn't stop. I kept playing. But then I looked again. I thought the face was familiar, and it was Dave Bartholomew. Dave Bartholomew at that time had the biggest band in New Orleans. He, he was like the man. So what was he, he was going for a fish sandwich at your mother's? He right? came in for a fish sandwich. You know, she, my mother had a, had a reputation of making the best potato salad in Kenner. So they'd come in for that fried perch and, a, and, the, and, and, and the potato salad. And uh, he said, well, no, don't stop, keep playing. So I played it. He said, play it again. I played it again. He said, you know, that, that could be a hit record. I had no idea what he was talking about. So I played it again for him. He said, you know what? The president of Specialty Records is coming to New Orleans. They had started recording young talent. The independents was beginning to understand what record business was, that there was a money in it. You know what I mean? So Art Root had had this big record with a guy called Percy Mayfield, uh, Please Send Me Someone to Love. And he was, he was expanding his record companies to be to, to the younger crowd because of that record. But he had never recorded any teenagers. So I was the first teenager. But this was the first side. There were two sides to the record. Yes, yeah, right. Okay, I had no idea. Today, if they watch my show, they're going to say, what is a record? You know? <laughs> okay. so there, there were two sides to the record, right? That's right. And there was big records, 78s. So if you took an album home, you, you need a truck that carried because it was 12 78s in so, so a you, pack. Now, so from the Lottie Miss Cloudy, you know, the okie dokie man, you came out with the lyrics for this song. That's right. And... And what was on the flip side, as they would say? Well, when I did Lord and Miss Claudia, I never heard the playback or nothing like that. Until you were in your father's car, right? That's right. What happened? Tell me that. My brother was, my brother and I was in a car, and Okie Dokie Smith said, Lord and Miss Claudia, I didn't play this record. It's getting, played it so much, it's getting white. You know, the records from the needle, they would get white, and you need new needles. So he said, I'm going to play it one more time a day. It's a young boy from Kenner, Louisiana. Lloyd Price and Lord and Miss Claudia. And I heard, well, what really happened? Let me tell you this, Mike. When, they, when I went down to record the song, Fats Domino was in the studio. So Dave Bartholomew had him to play that great introduction on Lord and Miss Claudia on the piano. There's never been nobody that ever played it like him. I don't think he had ever played it like that again. That great piano roll they did on the introduction in Lordy so Miss Claudia. How well did uh, Lordy Miss Claudia do? I mean, you were 17 years of age at this time, right? That's right. Art Root wrote a book. He still lives. He's 93 years old. The guy who owns Specialty Records. He wrote in his book about five years ago. Lordy Miss Claudia was the first million-selling record in America, ever. It's been recorded by every rock and roller who. The big, from the Beatles to Elvis on down, Fats Domino on James Brown, Wilson Pickett, you know, Tommy Rowe. But what's interesting that a lot of people in your profession, we're not sure what the profession is. <laughs> no, you know, <laughs> uh, no, you know, in your profession, were not smart enough to own the records. I mean, you've owned your own records. You own your music. You own the. You, you went into the production business, right? Yes, I did. Well, that happened after, I, you know, I got drafted. My music started to integrate the South. So the draft board called me in and said that the chairman of the armed service committee said I had to go in the Army. I had to go in the military, which I thought was very strange because I had four brothers in there. Right, and they, you weren't supposed to have uh, that many siblings. I had five. My fourth, my fifth brother, the one who gave me the horns, he couldn't even volunteer to go in the army, so he was in the Coast Guards. The Coast Guards was different from the from the armed service, so I thought it was strange that they had to draft me, and it was because of my music. I was integrating the South, so they took me on in the army, and 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 thought that that'd knock me off, I guess, but I managed to survive that, and. Yeah. Sorry, Mike. No, no. So you survived that. You finished the Army. And then what happens with ABC Records? ABC, when I, uh, when I came out, I went in my own uh, 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 music business. 
phoned my first record company, KRC Records. And when I got out of the Army, yeah, everybody... One of your first uh, re uh, clients on KRC Records was, what's his name, uh, a main guy? Lloyd Price. That's, no, besides <laughs> Lloyd Price. You remember, um, there was, I forgot who I read, it was one of the... Not on KRC. Okay. You're talking about Wilson Pickett. Wilson Pickett, right. Later yeah, on, he was later. on Double L. That was my second like label. Your second label. Yeah. But you had a deal with ABC, right? Yeah, ABC, ABC Paramount. ABC and Paramount Pictures, ABC Network and Paramount Pictures had just merged. And they, they went into the music business, the record business. And they had a record label called Paramount, ABC Paramount. And they didn't have nobody like me. So with just because the first song I wrote after coming out of the Army was a smash, but it was on my label. My cousin, who was Larry Williams and my, my valet and chauffeur, went to Art Roop. I had bought my contract back from Specialty Records. How I did that, being in special service in the Army, I was assigned to the adjutant general. Right, you told me you gained a lot of insight because of the guys from the Army. That's right, the young lawyers. And they said, listen, music business is about publishing. You should own all your songs and stuff like that. They had no idea what I was doing. But coming out of the Army, they, they equipped me about songs and how to go about the process of getting them for myself. So when I did, just because ABC didn't have this kind of music, they had Edie Gomez and Steve Lawrence, Rosemary Clooney. They had one black guy up there, Johnny Nash. And Johnny Nash was on Arthur Godfrey. I forgot the TV show. It was one of the biggest shows during that period. But nobody, they didn't have this kind of music. So Larry Williams, who was my cousin in valet, he had went to California and told Art Root he wrote the song. So Art Root at that time, Specialty Records, was the biggest rhythm and blues or uh, uh, rock and roll record company that recorded black artists. So he called me and said, Lord, we are going to cover you because that's my song. I wrote, Larry Williams wrote that song. Complete double cross between Art Root and Larry Williams. So I had to go to ABC. Fred Foster came to me and said, give us that record. We can protect you from, from Art Root. So that's what happened with my first record. And you got royalties. Now, since we only have 30 minutes, yeah. totally, <laughs> and there's so much to it. Okay, so... Staggerly personality, but personality, which has been, how many languages has that been? 17. 17. 17 dis different languages been recorded 169 times. And by how many, I mean, so many? Uh, uh, just, you name them. I mean, everybody from, I don't know if Frank did it, but all the big pop stars, all every TV show, commercials, General Motors, Fiat. But let's take a, a thir uh, like a minute. Do the, the, the opening of personality. Well, everybody has a personality, Mike. So you walk uh, with it, and it's because you've got personality, personality. Walk personality, personality. Talk with personality. personality smile with personality, personality. Charm with personality, personality. Love personality. Plus, you got a great big heart. So oh, over, over and over. over. Whoa, I'll be a fool for, for you. you. Now over and over, what more can I do? Everybody, cause you've got a <laughs> personality. Okay. <laughs> okay. So then, then you come to New York, right? Yes. You come to New York in the late uh, 50s. 58, 59. 58, uh, and let's talk about the years after that, 58 and going on, you know? Well, the years after that, I wrote this song, and uh, after I, ABC only had that one song. I wrote a song called You Need Love. You Need Love. I thought it was going to be the greatest song in the world. I was so impressed with Clyde McFadden. He was such a great writer. I wanted to write like Clyde McFadden. So I wrote this song, You Need Love. Called Sam Clark, who was the president of ABC, and said, Sam, I have a number one song for you, just like it's going to be bigger than Just Because. He asked me to come to New York. I went to New York played it for him. I said, I want the Ray Charles singers. I want a white choir. I want strings and a big horn. And he got all that for me. And Don Costa was my arranger. Don Costa, Frank Sinatra's man. That's right. He wrote this song, and I'm giving him the licks, how to go on this song. I'm thinking it's a great song. So, so you need a B-side. 
So I said, oh, I got a B-side. Well, now I'm a veteran who had used, I had used this song in Korea where I entertained uh, the, the generals, the field grade officers. It was called Stagger Lee. It was a mini play. That's what it was. So I said, I got a, I got a B-side. I, I just figured it was a throwaway. So I sat at the piano. I started playing it for him. And the night was clear. He thought that was funny because I said the night was clear. You know, the night was clear and the moon was yellow and the leaves came tumbling Ooh, down. Yeah. What up, up? And that big, nice chorus, you know, he said, he laughed. He fell on the floor laughing. Oh, you're not going to put that on the back of this record. I said, yes, I am. I said, this is a great song. I use it in Korea. The soldiers loved it, so I'm going to put it on the back of this record. One take. And I got a call. Larry Newton, the, the vice, the chairman, I mean, the, the, uh, man, the general manager of ABC, called me up and said, Lloyd, I got a call from Spokane, Washington. They said, we're on the wrong side of the record. You need love is not the hit. Stagger Lee is the hit. And I just would not let them turn that record over. So finally, they convinced me to turn the record over. We did. And one afternoon, 200,000 records between one and four. So I said, well, maybe we got to go with Stagger Lee. Stagger Lee wound up being number one for seven weeks. And uh, I think the end sales at ABC was three and a half million records. They've sold a lot since then. But that song has been recorded altogether 429 times. Lloyd Price Turntable, tell me about that. Lloyd Price Turntable. My objective, I wanted to have somewhere to house the band. So I took the old Birdland at 52nd and uh, Broadway and redone the whole, I stripped the whole place, renovated it, and made it to Lloyd Price Turntable to get the rhythm and blues folks from across 110th Street. The whole objective was to bring them downtown. I did because the Copa, Cabana, the Basin Street East, the, the Palladium, none of these clubs would bring the black acts downtown. So when I had James Brown line them up around the corner on Broadway at 52nd, <laughs> at 52nd and uh, Broadway, the... Uh, Everybody started bringing the acts downtown. So you had James Brown taking the, the crowd around the turntable, and you, you and you. I think it was written down that Nelson Rockefeller gave you the liquor license, right? Yes, he did. Well, he, Hugh Hefner hadn't gotten the license for the Playboy Club. This was in 1968. I knew Percy Sutton, so Ralph Cooper, who was an uptown disc jockey knew that I hadn't gotten my license. I was there sitting a year waiting on a license because you had to have the SLA, the cabaret. You had to have a double license to get approved. Now, I done re I've renovated the place. I'm paying rent sitting there a year. Ralph Cooper said, Lloyd, Percy Sutton going to be with Rockefeller at the Americana tonight having dinner. Go over there and talk to the governor. So well, that, that was right down my, I mean, that right down my alley. So about 7 o'clock, I got the call that Percy Sutton was in the hotel at the Americana with the governor. So I went over there. Hey, Percy, how you doing? And he said, I want you to meet the governor, Governor Rockefeller and his wife. He had just married this, this new wife. So I met them. And uh, so I told him, I said, Governor, I've been sitting around there. I, I'm trying to open a club, you know, on Broadway. I've been sitting there for a whole year paying rent. And I don't know, I just got to have my SLA license. I'm cleaner than the Pope. Everything, <laughs> see, I, there's nothing wrong with me. Why am I waiting on a license? So, he, you know, he laughed. And I have the photograph of him. He, he laughed. He said, you know, he, he said something to me. And I got it. Let's move on. You go to Africa and you're involved. You know, people know the famous Don King. But in reality... Don King's partner, the man who promoted the thriller in Manila with Ali and Fraser, was you. Yeah, well, Don, Don, Don and I had been friends forever. We've right, been from friends, Cleveland. And yeah, for 50 years. So Don, you know, everybody got to start somewhere. So by my popularity, and I introduced Don to everybody I knew, I introduced him. And Ali, who would, I had known Ali since he was 18 years old. So... I introduced Don to Ali, 
on, through, on the telephone by having Ali to sing happy birthday to his daughter. She was five years old, her fifth birthday. And so Don said, man, let me, let me, let me say hello to the champ. Man, man, he wasn't the champ then. And we had this, we'd have this song, Three Steps to the Crown. So we had to fight Sonny Liston's and Doug Jones and Joe Frazier. So when uh, Ali met Don, we had a charity for a little girl who had got raped in Cleveland. I had Johnny Nash try to get Sly Stone, all the big artists at that time, because they all knew me, and I would introduce him to Don. So we walked, he, he's a hardworking guy, I got to tell you that, because he just kept saying, man, make me big, make me big. Okay, I got to move on. Okay. So you did that, then, you know, you lived in Africa, you came back, and then you built, you were in the affordable housing, you built 42 houses. Uh, yeah, up in, at 100 and, 184th and Valentine. I put a partnership, the Lloyd Price Developing uh, Corporation, and partnerships with the New York City Partnership. And they gave me 50,000 square feet. And I went on and built 42 houses, top and bottom, uh, up at on 184th and Valentine. That whole circle up there, I built it through my uh, developing corporation. I wanted to do things, you know, because I didn't know whether or not I was going back in the show business. So I, w I wanted to learn different things. I'm... I'm always eager to learn different with, things. With like two minutes left, I got to make sure that, you know, I remind everybody in 1998, they made the right decision by putting you in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That's right. Okay. And you're also in the Bowling Hall of Fame, but that's separately. <laughs> over that. Yeah, right. Okay. Then you have the Lloyd Price Food products. I, uh, Lloyd Price Icon Foods. Right. Uh, our brand is Lord and Miss Claudie. Right. We figured it's been on the air maybe 700 million times by all the different artists around the world who recorded. We got Lord and Miss Claudia's Sweet Potato Cookies. Walmart, we're in Walmart, 500 and 486 Super Centers. Now, in addition to that, then the, the, the latest thing over here, if we got to talk, uh, is you re recently you, you wrote a book a couple years ago and you released another new CD recently. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. And then in addition to that, uh, Let's talk about the uh, the play that's going to come out eventually with Phil Ramone. Yeah, with well, Phil Ramone, Phil Ramone is 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 just a great producer. Uh, he's produced Sinatra, Barbara Streisand, Paul Simon. He's our musical guy on the Lloyd Price musical. They're going to do my life story uh, about from called Lord and Miss Claudie, the true king of the fifties, and it's going to all the things that I've done, Mike, will be inside the script. To right. make the musical. Including the story about New Orleans. Including the story about New Orleans. Right. Okay. And, of course, you can go up to LordPriceMusic.com and you can see most of it up there of what we're going to do. And, of course, the new album is up there as well at uh, LordPriceMusic.com. And they can also go to Lordy Miss Claudy. LordyMissClaudy.com and also Amazon.com. Right. And what was the book, the name of the book, Lloyd? The True King of the Fifties, Lordy Miss Claudy. The true king of the 50s. So, you know, writer, producer, director, promoter, bowler, okay? <laughs> you know, uh, you, you've had an interesting life, and it's continuing on, right, baby? Well, it's continuing on, Mike. Every day you wake up, you got to be motivated to do something. And I'm motivated with new things happening in my life. I mean, I guess that's what life is about. Doing things different, finding something new to do every day. And I'm so happy that I got Mr. Personality on my show, and thanks for being here today. Thank you, Mike. Pleasure's all mine.